Yes. Yes. I tell you what, what I'll do this. There we are. Thank you very much for, the, for your wonderful talk. My question is, um, as you as you saw, you had the opportunity to go through a with your micro, uh, your BBC micro, Beeb, yeah. uh, to learn programming. Huh. People who came ten years after you, who didn't have these facilities, but were still had the same attitudes, let's say, uh, did they fall by the wayside, or did they do something else to uh, yeah. make up? Uh, the reason I ask is I've had a lot of colleagues over the years who told me their children who were interested in programming, and all they wanted to do was to go to college and learn to do game design. Mm. Yes. So, so, so um, uh, what happened in the gap between the Beeb and the, and the, uh, the Raspberry Pi to, to children who wanted to program? I think a lot of them, I think a lot of them did fall by the wayside. Uh, I think that was a, that was a significant problem. Uh, I think that those, those people who didn't apply to study computer science at Cambridge, uh, you know, declining numbers, directly represented people falling by the wayside. Um, So I think a number of people did fall by the way, so um, people did find other things to do. Um, I had a, one of the best students I ever admitted to Cambridge, was a, um, a guy called Ben, ben Chow, uh, and he had learned to program on a graphical calculator. He'd written 3D computer games uh, on a graphical calculator. And that, that'd be, so there was some, when I say there's this 1% of kids who, no matter how hard you make it for them, they will always find a way to get these skills. And that was a pretty typical example. So you have people doing that. Um, I think that the sort of anecdotal, at least one of the things that motivated me to, um, to, do, to do the Raspberry Pi project was a couple of conversations, one with um, a cousin of mine, uh, and one with uh, a, a boy I met at, um, uh, at, a, at a barbecue. And, and both of them had said, in different ways, I really like playing computer games and I would love to be involved in the computing industry. And this uh, kid who I was talking to the barbecue, his mom came over and, and I said, oh no, so you sounds really interesting in programming, what computer have you got? And she said, oh, we've got Nintendo. Uh, and just this heartbreaking moment where, you know, you, I still get people say to me, um, uh, but hang on, why are you doing Raspberry Pi? Everyone has a PC. And it's just not, it's just not true. So, so I think it's that sense of wasted potential, particularly around games, particularly boys and games, there is a um, uh, there, there is a significant market of teenage boys who play, uh, you know, say Minecraft uh, or you know, more violent, violent things than that, um, and, um, and and would love to have a path into the industry. So we have there are two problems. We have a very broad brush. We have a, a problem with teenage boys because they um, want to uh, they play computer games and often they will have a an unfulfilled, a desire to become computer programmers, and that is um, not that they have no path to achieve that that, that goal. Um, we have a separate problem with girls. We have a separate problem with participation of girls in, in computing and interest of girls in computing, uh, and a culture which tends to uh, push girls away from STEM subjects, which tends to push push girls away from from that sort of thing. So we have kind of separate and it's very very broad brush. But uh, certainly the, the games one is, a, is, a, is, an interesting, is an interesting one. And it's an opportunity, it's a challenge and an opportunity, I think. Question over here. Hi. Um, around the time when you were starting the project, uh, like there weren't these other things going on in the world, like the one laptop per child program, the Arduino, and these mm. things. And now, I'm very glad that you stuck with it. But um, what was it about what you were doing that you just saw was something that you needed to do yeah. from these other projects? Okay, so, so how, do, how, do we, how do we differ from OLPC and Arduino? Um, I think to some extent it's an example of not doing the research. I was peripherally aware of these things, but I had to really think about them very hard. <laughs> so, uh, so maybe if I thought about them, particularly about Arduino, right? I mean, Arduino is an amazing, uh, OLPC um, is, to some extent there's, there's computing education and there's computing for education, right? So there's educating people about computers and there's using computers to educate people about stuff. Uh, and OLPC has always had quite a strong flavor of using computers to teach people about stuff and in particular uh, pushing a constructivist learning um, pedagogy, uh, the sort of Seymour Papert, MIT constructivist learning thing. 
uh, but not quite so much teaching people to program computers. So that's kind of maybe slightly off to one side and also in a, quite a different price bracket from us, quite a different price bracket able to go to places we could never go to. You know, we're not going to teach you, if you're in a village in the Andes with no electrical power, you're not going to be using a Raspberry Pi. You could use an OLPC in that environment. So, you know, there was a sort of different trade-off in terms of capability and price and, and flexibility. Um, Arduino, I mean, we are, we can, um, there's often been an attempt to sell us up as a competitor to the Arduino, though I think, you know, so, so certainly early on there were a number of press articles that talked about us as an Arduino as an Arduino competitor. I think well, we ac actually occupy very different space from the Arduino. We consume more power, we don't have the analog input, but we have a lot more processing capability and we can drive a display. I mean, that's the kind of shape of the difference. So I think we've ended up fitting in alongside Arduino, but to some extent, uh, we, yeah, we were just lucky we didn't look too, we didn't look too carefully. Um, in an introductory uh, university computer science course, you teach Hello World and variables and boredom. I think that's almost the equivalent of, say, teaching addition and someone who's doing maths at university or teaching how to punctuation in an yeah. English course. Do you think we'll ever get or, um, to a stage where we can sort of assume the basic knowledge of computer programming, say, yeah. the first years, and then you can get to the more advanced yeah. uh, topics soon? And, and when that might happen? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I certainly hope so. I, I was, are we ever going to get to a, a point where we can assume? Uh, Capability. I, 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 hope, I hope we will. Um, we have a, a new computer science curriculum in the UK now that's been the, the um, one of the 2011, just after we started doing this, Eric Schmidt um, turned up in the UK and he gave the McTaggart lecture, which is in Edinburgh. It's a, a media lecture. And he, his, the, the subject of his, of a significant part of his talk was, you guys are imbeciles, you invented the computer. <laughs> and now you teach everyone Excel and PowerPoint uh, at school, you're imbeciles, what are you doing? Um, and that was an incredibly helpful intervention. It really appears that he does care quite, I mean, he cares obviously very passionately about STEM education and seems to care very passionately about STEM education in the UK. And so in the aftermath of that, the government kind of realized that our curriculum was, was broken, uh, scrapped the curriculum, so stopped checking whether schools were teaching to the curriculum, uh, and then had a consultation exercise to introduce a new curriculum. That's coming in in, in the coming academic year in September. It's one of the reasons why we have this kind of urgency about um, helping facilitators, helping produce material to do, to do teacher training. Um, they let an actual honest to God computer scientist loose on this, a chap called Simon Peyton Jones, who works for uh, Microsoft Research in Cambridge. He's a hardcore theoretical computer scientist. Um, we now have a curriculum which appears to require seven year olds to reason about the time complexity of algorithms. Um, which is going to be fun and do simple debugging and flow charts. Um, so, so yeah, well, I think we might get there. I mean, schools in the UK are supposed to teach this stuff now, right? So, in theory, we should be able to assume that everybody has done that kind of hello world level programming by the time they're eight. Um, so, so yeah, that's really that is really encouraging. Obviously, particularly for a year. Might be further behind in Ireland. Well, I, I mean, I, I think what's interesting is we have some like. There are poster children like Estonia is the, usually the poster. For, for anything wacky in, you know, for anything really aggressive in terms of STEM education, Estonia is usually the poster child. They've implemented a, um, a um, computer-based maths curriculum for their maths uh, classes. They have coding for everyone. Um, so I, um, the interesting thing about the UK is the UK is kind of a medium-sized country. Uh, and it's interesting to see, I think if we can prove that we can bridge it's a little easier to do the stuff in Estonia, right? Because it's a small country, you can do interventions very fast. I think if we can prove in the UK that we can bridge that model to a medium-sized country, I think the prospects for places like Ireland being able to, um, being able to, to follow very fast uh, are, are, are good. And of course, there will be the English language uh, teaching materials um, will be in place, and there will be things which can just be taken and used in place. Uh, so I, I'm, I, when do I think? 2020. I think I'm really, um, we'll start to see something because we'll start to see some children who are currently about 14 or 15 and who are doing some of this stuff under the new curriculum. We'll start to see them in some 2017, 2018 appearing in the university system. Uh, but I think definitely 2020 we'll see a lot. 2025 will be the point at which uh, we will have had an entire cohort of children go all the way through the primary and secondary education system under the new regime. And that'll be. That'll be interesting. I don't, don't know if we're going to have to open a lot of new computer science faculties, but uh, it'll be, be good if it happens. Um, we talked a lot about education. Uh, what I'm interested in is, in 
terms of like home entertainment. Uh, like there's a huge movement now with massive broadband speeds coming in, people getting Netflix, uh, Amazon Prime videos, uh, Hulu, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And um, for me to kind of set up my relatives at the moment, the best I can get for Netflix is look, get a PS3 because it's yeah. you know, not going to crash. And yeah. Yeah, uh, so, so people using Raspberry Pis as consumer electronics products. We've definitely seen, we've seen a lot of this. Um, the, there's a, 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 a piece of software called XBMC, Xbox Media Center. Uh, um, about five or 600,000, maybe as many as a quarter of our users are XBMC users. So these are people who are buying a Pi and using it as an honest to piece of consumer electronics, they install XBMC on it. Now you can't access those commercial, um, I would very much like to come up with a solution which allow you to access those kind of commercial video sources like Netflix and Hulu. Um, I think there are security challenges. The, um, the, most of these services require you to certify to a very high level that it, your device can't be used to decrypt and pirate the, uh, the, the, the video data. Um, that's kind of there's a tension between that and the openness of the Pi. We provide so much documentation for the Pi that um, it's not entirely clear that you can uh, that, that that you can make those two things work together. You could close there are various mechanisms we could use to close the Pi down to kind of shut it down to to lock it down to a point where we could provide those security guarantees. Uh, but then of course that would undermine undermine the project. So I don't have an immediate solution. I. The requirements for standard definition streams are less onerous than the requirements for high definition streams. And I have from time to time, if I had an arbitrary amount of, of time to go and try and strike business deals, uh, I have thought that it might be interesting to go and try and get at least some standard definition commercial content on the device, on the assumption that 99% of people wouldn't pirate. Uh, and that because they're standard definition streams, the, the content providers don't care too much about the 1%. But it's, it's a massive, it is a massive opportunity. Um, these people are kind of doing, you know, De unsubscribing from their cable TV services and using things like Netflix and stuff. Uh, I noticed you talked a lot about sort of game children, and of course that's something that's, that everyone should sort of focus on. But what do you think about using Raspberry Pi to educate sort of people, say, a lot more than even yourself, or uh, even that sort of retirement age, that program? Mm -hmm. Do you think it can be used for that as well? So, so adult education using the Pi. Um, one of the interesting things, so the BBC, the BBC microcomputer that I had as a child um, was the, the app that I think called the BBC Computer Literacy Project. It was a computer designed to support a broader computer literacy effort that the BBC ran. Um, and because I was a child, I always thought the BBC Computer Literacy Program was about kids. But of course it wasn't at all. It was about kids and adults. Uh, it was the early 1980s in the UK, and that was a time of enormous change, uh, of enormous change in the employment market. A lot of sunset industries, a lot of people you know, losing their jobs in manufacturing and, and extractive industries. Um, and a big emphasis of that project was on encouraging, was on helping adults find new skills to go and access new careers. Um, there's a wonderful report about this by a lady called Tilly Blythe, that the, uh, she did a report for Nesta um, from the, the Science Museum. Uh, and we, we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at that, and we do think that there's there is an opportunity there. There's an opportunity there. A number of people have missed out. Particularly, I mean, there are actually some quite young people. There's people who fell into that window of time. You know, people who were children from the mid '90s onwards, um, who never had these opportunities. Who are now in their twenties, early thirties. Um, and so, so yeah, there is. We've seen quite a lot of uptake, kind of organic uptake in that area. Uh, and the raspberry jams that I mentioned are a big vector for doing that because those are not. Um, a lot of the clubs that you can use to learn to program are school related. So things like there's an organization called Code Club, which is a primary school related thing. The nice thing about the jams is they're not attached to schools and therefore we do get a lot of people kind of late learning and that can mean anything from you know, 25 to 70. You do see a lot of it. Uh, and it wouldn't be the first time that it wouldn't be. It's in the best conditions of the BBC Computer Literacy Project. Um, where do I see it going in the next five years? Um, it would be lovely to sell a lot more of them. Um, you know, it, it's. I think there's an opportunity with platforms like the Pi to provide people with uh, a general purpose computer at a much lower price. 
Um, so there's an opportunity to use this as a utility computing platform for people in the developed world, and in particular people in the developing world. One of the nice things about the Raspberry Pi is that you can connect it to an old-style television. We have an HDMI output, but we also have a composite output, so you can connect it to an analog TV. Now, um, there are a lot of people in the developing world in particular who just bought their first television. Right, you, know, you get people, people enter the middle class, one of the first things a lot of people buy a television before they buy a refrigerator. Um, you know, it's, it's really important. And these things, I went to um, Morocco about three or four years ago, it's in Marrakesh, and the number of television repair shops keeping like 25, 30 year old televisions in, uh, alive is, is remarkable. So I think there's a real opportunity for something like the Pi to ask these people, in the 1980s, our Commodore 64s and our BBCs and our Spectrums, to some extent, they were peripherals to our televisions. You know, the television is the most expensive piece of consumer electronics most families buy. That's true. That was true in the 80s in the West. It's true now in the West. It's true in the in the developing world today. Um, and so, I think there's a real opportunity for the Pi to be that kind of peripheral, cheap peripheral for this expensive thing that you bought. That gives you stops it being a passive consumption device and turns it into an our proper interactive device that you can use to create stuff on. So that's kind of. If I could have it go anywhere, that would be, that'd be where I'd like it to go, just kind of um, row us back a little bit from this world of appliance computing, from this world of kind of closed magic black box tablet games console computing that we have at the moment. Good question. Hello. Uh, thank you for your talk. And um, I'm, I'm intrigued. So I tried very hard for one program, and I even tried to scratch to be very honest. All right. Um, and the thing is, I just don't get it. And um, <laughs> at the same time, so I have all these computer science students, colleagues, and around me. So I just ask them, how can I improve my programming skills? And you know, they are geeks, and they are notoriously bad at communicating ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so your agenda then? Ouch. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think? Who's going to teach one's kids programming? Because you know geeks are not very good at it. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think you, I think you, I think you may, may have mentioned that before. Um, <laughs> um, it's a, it is a, sadly a really good point. Um, it, um, uh, the, the geeks are just terrible at, um, often terrible at communication. Um, a terrible empathy. I mean, I think it knows down of empathy. If you have, if you have been programming, not just in general, they find they're good human beings. Uh, we are good human beings. Um, but the the um, if you've been programming since you were eight years old, and the majority of our adult geeks have been programming since they were eight years old because they've come out of that tradition that I that I mentioned, it's really hard to emph to empathise with an adult who can't program because I just. I've tried to teach people to program sometimes and I really suck at it. So, uh, I, I, and, and it's really hard to understand what the problem is. Um, so, this is one of the things that's behind our hiring, our emphasis on teachers. Um, we've learned a lot doing this project and um, I think we started off with this kind of slightly anarchic, organic kind of model of um, that uh, we would just put a Raspberry Pi out there and it would happen. And I think. You get the 1% if you do that. You get the 1% of kids who, are, who will fight their way over, you know, through, through fire and flames to make this stuff happen, right? Um, but you won't get the other ones, and you won't get the adults who can't program. Um, so I think this is one of the reasons why we've changed to have more of a focus on facilitators, to have more of a focus on trying to give teachers the skills they need. Because teachers are professional educators and professional empathizers. You know, the, the, a large part of the job of a teacher is to empathize with the child or the adult who doesn't understand the thing that you just said. Um, and so these people are professionals. In the UK, they've just been handed a curriculum which is enormously different from the curriculum they have been teaching because they're typically the same people who were teaching PowerPoint two years ago and going to be expected to teach Python this year. Um, the government hasn't, although they've done a wonderful job with the curriculum, and they've made some token investment in teacher training, they haven't made an adequate investment in teacher training given the size of the problem. We think it's about £100 million investment required. 
Um, so what we're trying to do in our own small way is to provide the teaching, rather than us as a bunch of geeks trying to uh, teach people how to program, what we've done within Raspberry Pi, we've gone out and hired some of the best teachers we know, and I do feel guilty about having pulled teachers of that calibre, even though it's only two or three of them, out of the education system. Hire teachers who really understand this stuff, and then give them the freedom and the time to go, and the, the, the resources and the backup required to go and produce teaching material for children, and also teaching material for teachers, and to be able to run um, professional development. So I think that's the route. Uh, I think if you could, if we could find you a teacher who had been taught to be a geek rather than a geek who's trying to be a teacher, then I think that we, we, we maybe might have a little more success. I can recommend, if you did have a Raspberry Pi, I can recommend there's a book called Adventures in Raspberry Pi uh, by a lady called Carrie Ann Philbin, who is one of the teachers who we hired. She wrote that before she joined us. Uh, it is an it's, it's ten adventures that take you from knowing nothing to being able to do a little bit of Python, a little bit of Scratch, and a little bit of electronics, a little bit of interfacing. And you end up by building a, a, an internet-connected jukebox around your Raspberry Pi. Um, it's, you can buy it from our swag store for six pounds. Uh, and it is the most, uh, I have a book about Raspberry Pi that I, I co-wrote with somebody. Her book is so much better than mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, uh, the, the, I mean, her, her book is great. Um, but um, the, the, the contrast between them in terms of style is the, very demonstration of the point you, I think you're making. And just to add one thing to that, put your up hands up, those of you who are in my current gens class, you guys are working on learning how to program, you're working on it for exactly that reason. You want to be able to show kids how to get on with the Raspberry Pi. Mm. So you're another group that wants to really help with this, and it's a good thing. I should send you a crate of copies of this book. <laughs> um, we'll take them, we'll take them. Yes? <laughs> Tell me how many afterwards, I'll send you a crate. Uh, Evan, nice to meet you. Um, uh, feel free to answer this because I'm aware of your NDA obligations, but uh, in the near future, do you have any plans to release an upgraded Raspberry Pi? And uh, do you ever plan on the Raspberry Pi having the graphics facility of modern mobile phones today in like the next 20 years or so? Do I, do I plan on doing an upgraded Raspberry Pi? So I could, I could cost, I could, it's one of these wonderful situations where I could cost RS components. How much money would it cost you if I said I was going to release a new one in six months' time? Uh, quite, by, by destroying every single, the value of every single piece of inventory you're currently carrying. Um, we, that's, the, that's exactly the problem, right? That it's very hard for me to talk about the future because there's all this, this risk. You know, we have, when we were a little organization, we were very open. Now we're a bigger organization. We have partners who have made enormous financial investments in the platform. It's very hard for us to say anything that might damage the value of that inventory. Um, in general, though, um, certainly from a performance standpoint, um, I am not planning to upgrade the Raspberry Pi soon. Um, the level of graphical performance is fairly reasonable. So the level of graphical performance is that of a high-end smartphone in about 2011, um, early 2012 maybe. So we were pretty competitive when we launched. Um, We've seen the last two years a trend for um, the manufacturers of chips for smartphones and phones to throw silicon area at getting more graphics performance. And so you, you now have devices which have probably uh, you know, 5x the, uh, the performance of, uh, of the Pi um, shipping today. Um, in general, though, I think for the things that our users want to do, we have an adequate amount of power. Um, we have done a lot of software, a lot of what we do on the engineering side is software work to improve the, to tune up and improve the performance of the existing platform. The nice thing about that is if we launch a new platform, we orphan everyone who had the existing platform. Whereas if we keep tuning up the current platform, then every person who, all those two and a half million people who bought pies, they get a, a performance boost. Uh, and so it's kind of the trade off. We still think there's a significant amount of performance improvement available from software work on the, on the current Pi. Um, Oh, yeah, the other thing is open source. Uh, uh, we, uh, we had an announcement at the, end of, um, uh, at the end of February that we had Broadcom release the graphics driver stack, the full, the full register level documentation graphics driver stack for the graphics core that we use. Um, and that's really fantastic because that means we are the only platform of this sort that has a fully open, uh, a fully, a fully openly documented graphics stack. And yeah, that means 
we're inclined to stick with this technology for now, just for that, if nothing else. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I was in late, so apologies. This may have been mentioned earlier, but I'm wondering, are you familiar with the Coder Dojo movement in this country, and what do you think of it? Well, I think it's amazing. I think that. Uh, um, you got myself into massive trouble because I can only remember Bill Lau's name. What's the name of his his co-founder? Yes, James. So yeah, so Bill and Bill and James are amazing guys. I met them. I had the opportunity last year to come out to the B2E Young Scientists um, uh, final um, here in Dublin, and I met them both then. Um, they've done amazing stuff. Um, so Code Dojo, for those of you who don't know, is. Uh, it, <laughs> It's an attempt to replicate the organizational structure of the regulate um, ken, um, kendo uh, dojos, a completely decentralized organization of coding um, clubs. Uh, and they've done amazing, they've done amazing stuff. So yeah, they are actually one of our distribution partners for the um, Google Pi. So we got these 15,000 Raspberry Pi kits from Google. We gave some thousands of those to Code and Dojo to distribute. Uh, the wonderful thing about them, because they're decentralized, they, uh, my understanding is they were almost not able to accept them because there is no code, there is no code of dojo organization, there was just the code of dojo movement. And in the end, we were able to f figure out a way that we could get these to individual dojos. Um, so that, yeah, I guess, along with uh, another, another organization in the UK called Code Club, uh, which is this, this sort of primary school coding club thing, they've been the kind of two uh, big kind of community movements. And they're obviously not Pi specific but they've been these kind of two organizations that have sat alongside the pie and have been other, other members of this coalition for coding. Amazing people. Hey, thanks, thank you for your speech. It's been very, very interesting. Uh, I just want to raise a couple of comments because you've spoken extensively about the uh, new program in the United Kingdom, particularly with respect to the uh, syllabus which have been changed and made a good deal more deep, mm. like, but perhaps not a lot of analog support and position of China in the UK is it's not always very popular with the current government party. Like one of the big issues I would have with that with even with those changes though is the feeling that there seems to be a duty coming into it. Now I started a program when I was thirteen at school thanks to a maths teacher who took a week out of basic maths and said, We're going to do basic for a week. And it was a girls' school. Brilliant. So it's quite That's amazing. <laughs> it's That's quite amazing. unusual yeah. at the time. Yeah. And I thought this was absolutely fabulous. Now, I didn't program the whole way up through my teens, but I knew how to do it. And I worked as a programmer for a long time. I'm just wondering if you're sitting kids down at the age of eight at a time when there are also maybe some issues around numeracy, is it actually going to help or is it going to be hindrance when it comes to duty? Do you see that in your problem, particularly for non home percenters? So, so, you, so you mean, um, in terms of duty, do you mean? Imposing a duty on teachers to teach to teach. Imposing a duty, sorry, imposing a duty on kids to learn. Ah, okay. Because I um, think it's, it's something that works special because there's a joy and a joy curiosity. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it's philosophically enormously challenging, right? Um, because. And it goes back to the difference between geeks and geeks and teachers, right? I mean, I, another thing that geeks have trouble empathising with is the idea that anyone might not want to learn to program a computer. Um, and um, I, I, I guess I happen to feel it's a foundational skill. So the the it's now part of the computing in the UK is now part of the what we call the EBAC, which is this um, set of GCSEs. So GCSEs are our um, uh, six, age 16, age 16 exams, um, and some of them are now blessed by the current government. So the government has, um, historically there's been a league table system, and the government has tended to, um, uh, schools, some unscrupulous schools have tended to hunt for easier, um, push children towards easier subjects in order to get higher grades, in order to boost their league table positions. Um, the, uh, or at least that's the suspicion. Um, to try and counter this, the government has introduced the thing called the EBAC, which is a set of blessed um, GCSEs, which are the only ones which will count towards the league table, and they managed to get computing into that last year. Um, and um, it, it was got in, I believe, as another science. It went in alongside physics and physics and chemistry and biology. Um, I actually think it belongs in there uh, alongside maths and English. 
Uh, I believe it's a literacy skill. Um, I think that it is now so essential to understand how technology works that just as we force children who have no... It's really hard for me because I, what I really want is for all children to want to learn this. And we started out coming from an environment where we were... Um, where all we were talking about was just not denying children opportunity to discover this stuff. I think that it is... I think mandating children to learn it is important. Not to a very high level, but, you know, a week. A week would be fine as far as I'm concerned. But just mandating children to learn a little bit um, in the same way that we uh, mandate that they learn maths even if they don't like it, or mandate that, that, that they learn English if, even if they don't like it, is probably justifiable. And it, it, it's enormously difficult for me because I don't want that. <laughs> what I want is for them to want it. And I think actually, almost uniquely among school subjects, it can be taught rigorously in so many different ways. And that's why you need a multiplicity of different sorts of teaching material and different teaching styles. I think that you can teach it in so many ways without sacrificing rigor that there is a good chance we can actually get there. And that's probably the, that's probably, that's the dream, right? But it is a, it is a, it's an aspiration. Um, and I think it's gonna be, we're gonna learn a lot from trying to do this in the UK. You know, it's in the national curriculum. You've got to teach it. Um, you know, you've got to teach, got to teach programming. Um, we're going to learn a lot by trying to do that. Um, and um, it's going to take a long time to shake out. It's going to take a long time to train up the teachers. Um, the good thing is teachers are so keen to learn about this stuff. We are running a, as, a, as a trial. We didn't intend to be in the CPD business, but we are running a professional development training exercise over the year for 26 teachers. Um, over Easter, the level we were so massively oversubscribed, we could have filled that course ten times over. Um, so yeah, the level of passion from teachers, yeah. professionals, they want to do a good job. Um, and I think it's just about trying to find a way to do that and to square the circle in terms of budget as well, because it's, it's expensive. Teacher training is expensive, and you doing it well is expensive. And there's always a tendency to appeal to kind of cascade type methods. And cascade is what you do when you don't have any money. Uh, and we don't... Very challenging. I could just answer that. I could just replace that entire question with very challenging. Because it is very challenging. <laughs> and I don't have a good answer. But we're going to find out. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody for the questions. Oh, I have one more. Have you ever considered uh, have I ever considered providing a training material through a MOOC? Yes, absolutely. In fact, we have a MOOC. Um, so uh, there is a thing called, we are partners with, along with an organisation called Cambridge Assessment, uh, which is a Cambridge-based exam board. It's the parent company of OCR, one of the big three exam boards in the UK. Um, we are partners in a MOOC called Cambridge GCSE Computing Online. Um, it, um, OCR is a very well-regarded and very rigorous um, GCSE and computing, um, uh, and they're anticipating obviously now that computing is an EBAC subject, and now that computing has been mandated into the uh, proper computing has been mandated into the national curriculum, they're expecting a lot of take up, and there's a challenge around the number of teachers. And so um, over the summer last year, they started putting together a MOOC which consists of about 120 short video exercises and supporting questions and then a, a fairly broad range of, they call that the kind of the spine, that exactly covers all of the topics. If you've watched all those videos and understood them and done the exercises, then you've covered the curriculum on a bare bones level. And then it's kind of like what they call ribcage, like lots of kind of supporting material that goes around the outside of it and allows children to explore in greater depth. Um, topics they find interesting. So this thing has been uh, live since September. Um, it has now a good fraction of the videos are now in there. They've kind of rolled in over the course of this academic year. Definitely worth going having a look at. And it's free. Um, and it's a powerful way of it's a powerful way of reaching children who don't have local a local facilitator who can assist them. It's a powerful way of. Um, 
increasing the skill level of the facilitators. A significant number of the people who've been using this this year are teachers who know that the rest of them are coming next year, they've got to prepare for. It's another thing that gives us optimism about the, the sort of professional enthusiasm that teachers have for this, uh, for this subject. Um, and then the other thing that we're hoping to see perhaps from next year is people using this MOOC in the flip mode. So there's this kind of idea that one of the things you can do with MOOCs, the way in which MOOCs are a, an accessory to existing teaching rather than a competitor to existing teaching is that you can tell your students to go away and study for today's lesson the night before and then turn the lesson into a debugging session on, on like what didn't you understand about that video. So people aren't coming in the room cold. Uh, and we're, we're hoping to see some evidence. There is some good evidence that flip methodologies work quite well at the tertiary level. Um, I, we're, it's fairly rare to try and do a MOOC. To, um, to, uh, right now, to do, try and do a school-targeted MOOC is still quite a rare thing. And we're kind of hoping that um, we'll see some evidence that the flip methodology works uh, in secondary classes as well. Who knows, maybe primary classes. <laughs> Get there in the end. One final question. I think very much I just wanted to ask you something. Why don't you try and take a different angle the children to get their hands on like the first thing you have to find? Because like those people who program today have never attended grass or anything like that. And like for instance, I remember when I was like 10 we went on this thing called like a role play game on the farm. And there were only 10 out of all of us who knew those people who were like 15, but we were just being kids. And it all started kind of like getting our hands on coding because we wanted to perform to the practice. They wanted to like plug in the and everything. Mm -hmm. And it was really this whole game that we just do it. Like there was nothing about it that we wanted to do unless it was really to improve our own kid experience and everything. Mm -hmm. So do you hear it for instance like getting new strategy and marketing like in sorry, uh, marketing and like kind of like the, um, you can build your own game and do it yourself kind of. Oh. Um, so, so actually, so that's, that's an interesting question. You know, uh, uh, as, I, as I understood the question, what's the trade-off between formal teaching and kind of appealing directly to kids and to their interests? Um, what you're describing is effectively our default business model. That was what we thought we were going to do. Um, you know, that you know, Raspberry Pi has historically been marketed to children. Um, it's been marketed as a thing for kids, not a thing for schools, not a thing for the formal education system. We've kind of been dragged into the formal system by the fact that the government now has this sudden enthusiasm um, for it, and you know, it's a vacuum that's kind of pulled us in. Um, we are still very committed to this as a kind of that more anarchic kind of model of giving kids stuff. And one really fantastic thing, a company called Mojang, uh, who wrote uh, Minecraft, um, they did a special version, a special version of Minecraft that runs on the Pi that you can program. So it has a, you, it's, it's like a regular game of Minecraft, regular game of the mobile version of Minecraft, but it has a programming interface. And one of the wonderful things about that, you were saying, y you learn about programming because it let you do a thing you cared about. Um, if you're Minecraft and you want to build a floor out of bricks, you get your brick brick laying tool and you, you know, brick 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 brick. You like this? You want to lay a hundred bricks down? You've got to click the mouse a hundred times. Um, the, um, the wonderful thing about Minecraft on the Pi is you can connect it to, to it from a programming language and issue commands into the world from the programming language. So if you're in Python, you can go for x in range 10, for y in range 10, brick x, y, and type that, hit enter, and a 10 by 10 square of bricks will appear on the floor. And the great thing about this, it lets kids do things that they care about, as kids do Minecraft models and build stuff. It dramatizes to kids what computers are for. So computers, why can why computers, why, 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 why do we have computers for? Computers exist to automate well-specified repetitive tasks. Um, and so it gives them something they're interested in, Minecraft, the ability to do more stuff in that thing they're interested in, either build bigger structures in Minecraft or write new game modes for, for um, Minecraft. Um, and it dramatizes to them the reason why we get involved in this stuff and why all, this, all these amazing tools exist, you know, tools that don't exist to play Minecraft, right? You know, they exist to add numbers up really fast. So. Which I still think is cool, but that's because I'm a geek and not a teacher. Um, cool. Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions.